I'm Laura Forsyth. I am Dr. Laura Forsyth. I am the counseling psychologist here at Moore Park College and very pleased, um, delighted in fact, to be presenting uh, for the second time in our whole year of wellness all the variety of lectures and presentations that you have may seen, you may have seen advertised um, throughout the year on a variety of topics having to do with well-being and wellness and being kind of being the best you, you know, not just health as a matter of not being ill or not being burdened or not being stressed, but wellness as the things that we can do that actually increase our well-being, you know, to be our best selves. And I'm going to be talking about this whole concept of happiness and this very interesting idea that your grandmother probably told you and that your parents might have nagged you about or that you may have even advised other people to do, that there are things that we can do intentionally that actually expand our own experience of being happy and that is a worthwhile and worthy thing to do, that we are not just have to go with what life gives us, but we can act on our own experience that we can create and shape our own experience. And because I, as a counseling psychologist, come out of a fairly hardcore research program up at University of Santa Barbara, for me, if I can't cite something and tell you that there is empirical evidence behind it, I can hardly say it. Or I have to say, well, there's no evidence here, but I think this is how it works. Well, today, I have no issues with this because I'm going to be going through a whole series of summaries of some of the most recent research in the field of positive psychology that supports and tracks and has demonstrated that there are changes and enduring changes that can be made. So this is not all kind of la la, nice ideas. We're talking science here, folks. So just saying. All right. Um, might talk a little bit later on about services at the Student Health Center, but did you know that we have a psychology staff at the Student Health Center? Everybody yes? No? Okay, it's kind of a little, some people are like, what? You have therapy? Psychologists? Yeah, we do. It, short term, but I think it's decently awesome. Decently awesome. Okay. Um, let's see. So, first things first. Let us define Terms. Oh no, actually before that, let's do something else. Little, I'm hoping to have some conversation here and for you guys to have some notions of how this applies. So let's start with this to begin with. This is called the Subjective Happiness Scale and it was developed by Sonia Lubomirsky and her colleagues down at U University of California Riverside. And so if everybody would just grab a, a, a scrap of paper or count on your fingers or do whatever you want to do and to yourself privately, Read each item, answer, rate yourself, don't overthink it, just rate, and sum it up, take the average of the scores, remember that, four items. And I'll give you a sec. In general, I consider myself not a very happy person to a very happy person, rate one to seven. Compared to most of my peers, the other people I w I'm around, I consider myself less happy or more happy, one to seven. Some people are generally very happy. They re enjoy life regardless of what's going on, getting the most out of everything. To what extent does this characterization apply to you, one to seven? And then the last item, some people are generally not very happy. You know, although things may be going well, and they're not depressed, they never seem as happy as they might be. To what extent does that apply to you? One to seven, okay? So just make a note of your individual item scores and also of the mean, of the average. Okay. Everybody good? Okay. So let's start off, and I need to ask you guys where, how you see this. What is happiness? How would you define it? What does it mean to you? How do you know when you're having, when you're happy? You know, what, what makes you happy? Just pop off. Please do not overthink. Just whatever occurs. Nothing will ever leave this room. Yes. Oh, and pardon me, one second. For recording purposes, the mic. I would say it's like being content with yourself and your, your, I guess, your surroundings, environment, and at the same time. Contentment. Contentment, but at the same time, I don't think that happens without gratitude and being grateful for what you have, so. 
gratitude leads gratitude appreciation right of what you've got that leads to greater contentment sure okay okay and next got right there if you'll hand it, hand it down to him and thank you I consider happiness freedom and uh, self-expression and just laughing around your best friends that's my form of happiness definitely so you very uh, very directly about what makes you happy yeah what makes you happy and where our first respondent was talking about um, kind of the process one of the things that leads to a, an aspect of happiness this appreciation and gratitude for the, th the good things are going on so we got a couple of pieces very yeah. solid pieces here. and animal crackers sometimes. animal crackers yes except the frosted ones the frosted ones with the little sprinkles on them yes I mean just the you know the, the non frosted ones are okay but oh, the, the sprinkles much better. So, how about for oh, you? Um, I was going to say, just in terms of, um, I guess, knowing you're happy or the feeling of happiness, kind of a, kind of a much more light, carefree feeling versus feeling weighed down by worries or concerns. There's kind a of just feeling a, a lightness. Sense. Yeah, an opening of the, an opening of the heart. If we're going to get yogic about it. If you're going to, and <laughs> the yogic folks have the great advantage of having a language to talk about that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, you can see it in posture, yeah? You can see it in how people move. You can see it in how we carry ourselves. There's an expression that expresses itself even before we say anything. You know, it, it isn't always 100%, you know, necessarily what's happening, but it, it often is, mm -hmm. sometimes more so than what people say. Mm -hmm. So what else, what else? Other ideas? Other? <laughs> okay. I guess this gets a little bit more into like, and and mic up, please. Just oh sure, perfect. Thanks. I guess this gets a little bit more into um, morality, but I mean, it's definitely. I mean, happiness can't really come unless there's some kind of goodness, and I don't mean relative goodness, like if you like chocolate, not like vanilla. I mean, like a moral goodness, like if your if your behaviors are, you know, only to please yourself, and you maybe are momentarily happy. That ultimately does not lead to real like what would be genuine happiness and so and there's a vice versa to that as well so you know it's your you know whether it's your actions or your perspective moral goodness is really the, one of the only paths that you can lead you to real happiness because the temporary happiness doesn't really last and you know it's again it, it's definitely a little bit more on that like moral right and wrong argument and that's kind of a separate t conversation but if uh, for the sake of argument not. if there is a such thing as right and wrong you know, the, the wrong actions are always going to lead to unhappiness and the right actions are always going to lead to happiness. Okay. So you have just, in fact, all of your responses have gone straight to what we were going to be talking about today. And I want to highlight a couple of the things that, that you have just said because it opens up a part a, some of these important aspects of the discussion. Let's keep in mind that the, all this is sort of... of uh, this and that, not this or that, to, you know, that we have an inclusive idea about this. A um, couple of things I want to highlight about what this our person had just said is that there is this element of effort involved, that it is not something that, that just you sit back and wait for it to come to you, but that you do because you are doing things that have a value to them and that they have a meaning to them and that it's bigger than your own temporary um, what feels good right now. There's a communicative aspect to um, enduring happiness. And, and part of, why, of course, why I'm highlighting this, it's not going to be a surprise to anybody, is this, is this is a very widely held understanding about this. And that there, it is, um, there is a sense of doing something that makes something happen, doing things or you know, acting in such a way that it gets bigger than you. And then does that, it, is that an okay, that's that sufficient for the idea of morality? Oh yeah, definitely, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. And, uh, and always nice to know that, that when you cook some of this stuff down in most of the world's faiths and philosophies, that there is a tremendous amount of overlap around these sorts of ideas and they basically overlap about being pro-social and being kind and doing things with an awareness of how your actions affect other people and doing stuff that makes stuff better rather than indulging yourself temporarily, you know, regardless of what happens to anybody else. And you know, I think most, it would be fair to say that most faiths and philosophies concur on that point, that, that things go better when we do that and it's worth doing it. 
So good there. The other thing I wanted to highlight before we move on is this idea that there is the temporary sensory, you know, kind of Disneyland, woohoo, happiness. And then there's this other, th and that comes and goes. It comes and goes and comes and goes, but there's this, hor this other aspect of it that is much more enduring and doesn't necessarily, isn't fun. You know, it's not fun, it's, it, it, but, but fun things, you know, as you had said, in the midst of all this, there's a bunch of fun, awesome things that absolutely provide happiness. You know, what do I do to start off today? I come in and I'm showing you this goofy video and people are dancing all over the world and there's kids and there's old people and big people and little people and, you know, the whole shamu and they're just having a big old time and, you know, catchy little pop tune. And like, I can't resist it. I don't know about anybody else here. But at least today, I'm, I've given over to that. I'm, da, 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 you know, got this earworm going. I'm loving it. It's great. We communicate. This stuff is, is very much um, infectious in that way. OK, so other ideas about happy. The new thing we're talking, people are thinking. Anything else that would be separate? And got to run the mic down, please. Or, or your, your, your sage comments will be lost to posterity. I was thinking when you were just talking about that, like also random acts of kindness and like, you know, I remember working in a charity, like working in a, a shelter. At the end of the day, I felt really good. And it was like long lasting rather than if I had a beer or something like that. Then mm. that's kind of that sort of temporary happiness. Mm. And We're going to talk about this a little later on, about yeah. what's up with that whole experience. Yeah. Because you're, you know, you're absolutely right on, and we'll talk. We're going to talk a little bit about, about not only that that happens, but maybe a little bit about the mechanisms about how that happens. You know, because we're getting all science about this. Okay. Other thoughts? Other ideas? Um, down here, please. Down in front. Okay. Let me come over and grab. So I feel like happiness is kind of like clarity, where. Uh, once you reach a point of clarity, you know, it, you know, it's open and then you feel happy versus uh, being, things being blocked and you kind of feel down or sad. Mm -hmm. And I feel like temporary happiness is, you know, you have the temporary clarity for the scenario, but then your long-term happiness is you've, you have now a clear future so of sort. So would that be fair to say that, that in this idea, what's part of what makes that happen is having some goals and that even if you don't get there that you can see yourself moving towards your goals correct and the baby steps could be your temporary happiness mm -hmm. to the future of your yeah. goal absolutely okay awesome 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 this is great and uh, i'm just thinking if i keep, keep you guys talking then i don't even have to go through the slides but I put, I, I put some time in on these slides so let's see what we got okay so Research-wise, science-wise, science it, essentially these, there are two components would, they, that comprise happiness. And I think we've already talked about this you know, quite nicely. There's the positive affect side, the, the joy, the contentment, the, the feel good, the, you know, the jubilance, the got the rhythm kind of stuff. The, you know, the, if you read formal definitions of happiness, it gets kind of exciting. It goes everywhere from you know, pleasure and um, uh, amusement to delight to ecstasy to like, you know, amazing, mind-boggling experiences, which most of us don't have very often. But we all kind of like. You know, the, the, it, happiness scale runs way up into some fairly intense experiences. But overall, it's that sense of you know, well-being, you know, life is good. And I'll tell you something, too. When psychologists first started researching happiness, they didn't call it happiness. They called it subjective well-being. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, why, you know, why you had to have this like, formal no name? The other uh, aspect of happiness that we've really done a nice job with, you guys have done, done a great job with, is that satisfaction and meaning aspect that is much more enduring that it is, is kind of a path sort of thing, and that it, it requires effort. There is, um, it doesn't mean that you are joyous every single moment, but it is that sustaining sense of going towards something that has, holds value for you. Um, and we'll talk some about how this plays out in people's lives when they have cultivated that for themselves. So this whole idea of studying happiness, like really? Scientific research on happiness. Aren't there more important things, you know, depression and anxiety and disorders and bad things, you know, like urgent, urgent, important things to study? 
you know, it, it, this was not studied for a long time because there's this notion, like nobody thought of it kind of. We were all, you know, our field, my field was busy looking at the bad stuff, looking at the clinical difficulties. And within that sort of, there were always people who were interested in the positive side of experience, but the notion was that it was kind of frivolous and, and that it was more like just sort of one of those things that was not worthwhile. You know, it's all that unicorns and rainbows and lollipops and like everybody should know how to do this. We don't need to research it. But actually, in fact, all of human experience is worthy of scientific research. And here's the interesting thing. This depression and anxiety stuff that I mentioned a little bit ago, well, what, where our field is moving at this point is away from a sole focus on treating or dealing directly with uh, disorder. Even if you know, someone comes in, they have profound depression, or they've been anxious for years, all this stuff's going on. We are not just working, I as a clinician, as a, you know, as a doctor, am not just working on how bad they feel. I'm working with the person for them to find out ways that allow them to do things that cultivate happiness within them. And we might, might not be talking about the problems even. Sort of like, okay, there that is. We'll do some work on that, but we're going to be working in this whole, whole other area. And it is worthwhile because of that. And just even when you don't have some kind of, of mental health issue going on, look what happens when people are happier. You know, the physical health improves. And this is longitudinal research. This is the kind of research where they said, okay, rate your happiness, blah, 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 thanks, see you in 15 years. Thanks, we'll be back in 20 years. You know, and, and then see how people are doing in life. So what they found is healthy, happier life, immune function, pe people who are happier resist catching colds when they have been deliberately infected with rhinovirus. Seriously. Um, cope much better with stress and trauma, resilient. Pain happens, suffering happens, but resilience and the ability to bounce back, keep going, incorporate that to keep on keeping on far greater in people who have higher levels of happiness. Interesting thing here, we're going to be talking a little bit about the money thing and more in a moment, is that people who are happier turn out later to make, have a higher income. Remember, this is a lot of this is longitudinal. And it isn't just like, yes, I have a better job. Yes, I have a good income. Yes, I'm happy because of that. This is, there's a predictive aspect to it. Make sense, that difference? Because definitely, you know, having better circumstances and com more comfortable circumstances than less comfortable circumstances or even, you know, poverty and privation for sure is a factor in happiness. But we're talking about what predicts. People who are happier are more productive at work, they're more creative, they tend to do more. We'll talk some more about this in a bit. They're better leaders, they're better negotiators. And, you know, some of this is kind of common sense, like you sort of expect it, but the data does back it up. Social relationships, happier people have more friends. They have more social support. It's an interactive thing. They're more likely to marry and have their marriages be fulfilling. They're less likely to divorce. They do, but it's just not at the same rate of people who rated themselves as unhappy early on. And we're assuming, too, that those folks who rated themselves as unhappy had not, as a group, done a whole major thing to change that for themselves. Okay. And they're more, people who are happier are more helpful to others, more philanthropic. And that starts to go right back to that issue that you'd mentioned a moment ago about how you felt about you and what you were doing when you were doing charitable work. That there was, this, there, there was kind of this nourishing, you know, sustaining aspect to it emotionally. Okay. And at this point, too, jump in if something doesn't make sense or you have a question or, you know, we'll, we, we're a small and select group so we get to play a little bit and, uh, and have a conversation along the way. Okay, so how do you get to happy? And I notice that get to, this is a process stuff. Now, conventional wisdom says that if you're successful, you go to school, you work really hard, you get a job, you work really hard, you get your stuff, you get your house, you get your stuff, you get all your stuff, then you're going to be happy. Success precedes happiness. Happiness is a result of success at some thing, you know, of accomplishments and acquisition and having stuff. So here we go. Happiness is just around the corner. Work harder, work harder. Happiness is not just around the corner. Work harder, work harder. Does this look familiar? You ever heard anything about this? Whether or not someone talked about it explicitly? So it's an interesting thing. I have uh, teenagers at home. And my older guy, who is going through, or actually 
maybe starting to emerge from, but has spent some time in the teenage angst stage of looking at the values of the world around them and finding them uh, wanting, you know, like, oh, I don't know about the society and what's going on, and uh, there's a lot of ridiculousness happening. Um, has uh, tackled this exact issue in saying that, you know, watching his two professional parents work like crazy and be juggling who's picking up the kids and what's going on, and man, I'm really busy, I got the stuff going on. His dad and I both have careers that we really, really like and that we feel very fortunate to have, but also, um, you know, can be very demanding, and in his dad's case, very high stress. And he's like, I don't want any of this. Screw this. I'm going to have my little beach shack. I'm going to surf. I'm going to, you know, he, like, he's, he, it is not appealing to him to, to do this rat race. Now, his mom is assuming that this is a developmental process, and he will find his way to what is meaningful to him. But at different points, if you'd said, what do you want to be when you grow up, he'd said, I don't know, but not, a, you know, not this, not that, not what my mom does, not what my dad does. Nah. You know, I don't want to live that lifestyle, because it's too much hassle. So, because you know, those little rats just keep running around the corner. So, but if we start from the other end, you know, like instead of the success happiness, success leads to happiness. So what about if it's, that's backwards and we look at happiness fostering success? And in fact, if you look at what happens empirically in the workplace, in home, in community, wherever it is, that this is what you see. Here's some examples about how that plays out at work. That people who are happier do more. They perform better at assigned tasks. You know, they've got a better attitude. They're not resisting the whole process, even if it's kind of tedious. And these tasks could be flipping burgers, or they could be running spreadsheets, or they could be doing things that are fun or tedious or whatever. They just, in general, tend to do a better job and do a little bit more. They do extra. They help people. They've got the energy. The notion here, you know, one commonsensical one, one, one common sense explanation is that you have more energy, therefore you have more to give. You're not in the energy conservation mode that happens when you're feeling low or unhappy. That, that takes a lot of energy and you don't have as much to begin with. So when you're feeling better, you've got more juice and you can do more, and that tends to do this very nice feed-forward process. People like it when you help them. Your boss likes it when you do a little bit extra. You know, you influence people positively in your workplace or anywhere at school. If you are like, okay, I'm good, you know, you're just kind of carrying that. You don't have to say anything, but it's your attitude that communicates itself, and that tends to foster other things going on. You get more social support. And there's, you know, if there's a conflict, you can cooperate and be collaborative as opposed to, well, screw you and not my way, or, well, I don't want to do this. You know, you can surf the intensity of frustration a bit more readily. People do well autonomously. They do well working in groups um, in general. They, they have more self-efficacy. And self-efficacy, any, anybody not know that term? It's a kind of a technical psychological term. You ever heard about it before? I need a yes or a no. Okay, okay, thank you. No shame on that one. Self-efficacy, in my mind, is more important to understand than self-esteem. Self-efficacy is a concept um, came out of Stanford that basically is the sense that you have that your efforts and what you do is going to move you towards your goals. It's the little engine that could. Yeah, I think I can, I think I can. And it tends to make people persist under challenge, which we all know that the person who persists is more likely to hit where they're going than the person who doesn't. I mean, there's times when, you know, there's always an exception. But in fact, persistence is such a powerful predictor for success that it is way more important than talent or ability or smart. Persistence. Persistence. I could go on and on and on and study after study after study after study. Persistence predicts success and is a bigger deal. You do not have to be the smartest. You do not have to have the most natural ability. In fact, natural, you know, talent is greatly overrated in some ways. And even people who are highly talented work their butts off to be, have mastery. We tend to have this illusion that they don't, you know, that, that someone comes out and they can just do it, they can just take the test and they nailed it, or they can do this amazing performance and they just do it and all comes easily. No. There's going to be varying amounts of work that people need to do, but anybody who's gotten good at something has put in the time. But we somehow, you know, we've got this idea that, they, that it, that shouldn't be necessary. So anyway, self-efficacy. 
Because when you feel like you can do stuff, you have more confidence. You're going to risk more. You're going to put the energy out. You're going to be more likely to be successful. And if you're not, you're more likely to be able to say, OK, well, that didn't work. Let me reassess and figure out how to do it differently and keep on. You know, if at first you don't succeed, et cetera. And people you know, who are happier can take more risks. They can be more curious and you know, more problem solving. They've got that energy they're not holding in. So here I am. Um, now let's talk about money and happiness. We all know money doesn't buy happiness. Yes, no, sort of? I mean, we've all heard it at least. Except that it does. Sometimes in, under certain conditions if you're smart about it. So where does money n buy happiness? It buys it in terms of giving you opportunities to, uh, to take care of your needs to have security, to have a sense of opportunity. OK, I've got enough money to cover my tuition. Whew, man, I can see possibility opens up. You're not having to think about, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Um, a study just came out from UCLA oh, earlier this year about the number of people in LA County um, at which they had uh, stratified income levels, how many people at what income level reported having to worry seriously about being able to feed their household, that there would be periods of being hungry. And once you got below $30,000 a year in LA County, that number went up a lot. Now, is it possible to be happy when you're worried about, okay, we're not we're going to be hungry some of the time this month? Yes, but it is not going to be as available to you because you got, it's hard. Things are hard. So. Money helps when it lets us live safely, have some security, live safely, and have a sense of opportunity. But past that, it doesn't do a whole lot. Because I will tell you, as a practicing psychologist, I see people who are poor, I see people who are very affluent. And obviously, people who are very affluent are just as screwed up as people who are not. <laughs> In fact, some, you could make a very good argument for the very affluent folks have a whole set of problems that the rest of us would think, thank goodness we don't have to deal with that. This real sense of alienation, it's, it's not so fun. Um, so the other thing that spending money on, that where that creates happiness, is in create, buying experience. Doing stuff together with your family, traveling, learning something, teaching yourself something, uh, doing things that allow you to have enjoyable, meaningful experiences, whatever those might be for you, you know, to pursue music or to go on a retreat and, and pursue whatever your spiritual interests are or to be able to travel someplace or to be able to treat your, you know, take all your friends out to Starbucks and you have this great time sitting around yakety yakety yak. That kind of stuff is what where spending money leads to greater happiness. There is also an enormous body of research on how spending money on other people makes people happier than when they spend it on themselves. And that's the same whether you, spend, you buy somebody else the coffee rather than buying it for yourself, or um, if you are making significant charitable contributions. It pushes, it just plays a little tone for us, and it is that sense of meaningful action. It's an interesting thing, too, because a lot of times when you get money, it's like, whoa, I can get these things. And they're great and shiny for a little while, but not in, it, sometimes that doesn't last. So it's more like materialism is the thing that doesn't create happiness. And money devoted towards stuff is burdensome. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. It's a hold that thought moment. I was just going to elaborate a little on that. Um, it's kind of like, again, another just kind of open-ended question. Like a lot of times, I, a couple times I've been in a class and I've asked other students, like, do you guys think money is good? And invariably, everyone says, oh, money's evil, money's evil, money's bad. But we and, all would like a little more than what we have. Right, sure. And the reason that money is good is because it's people that do things that are evil or good. It's not money. Money is just a, it's a concept. It's you know, it's a it's peaceful, access to resources. It, yeah, it's an access to resources. It, it's a, a means for peaceful means of exchange. I mean, in concept, it's very civilized, and um, it's just it's, it's it's interesting because when I was younger, I thought the same thing. Oh, money's evil. Look at all the horrible things people do for money, and look at all the 
pain in the world because of money, but it's really because of what people do for money that is leading to that unhappiness or happiness. So and let's, let's jump off of that and go ahead and hold the microphone there. We'll have you run it around the next time. Um, that that's very much a theme in everything that we're going to, the rest of we're going to be talking about for the next half an hour or so is that it is, we're looking for those places when we can make intentional choices and decide how we want to think and how we want to act and, and kind of keep after it that shapes what our experience is going to be. But when we are locked into, we've got that confusion about money as being necessary or things being necessary. The problem is, is us as human beings, there's stuff, just having big nice stuff, we habituate to it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So why is it hard to be happy? In part because happiness is a temperament thing. It, it, it is one of the things that is covered by temperament, our, our, our biologically based factors that influence our personality. There are people who are born, born sunny and they've been sunny all their lives. There are people who are born not so sunny and they've been like that all their lives. It is a genetically based thing and you know, as the years go on, we may be able to stick somebody's head in the brain scan machine and say, or the little cap. I've, I envision a cap, I'll have it on my shelf, I'll bip on somebody's head, we'll look at the screen and go, oh, okay, now I see what's going on and be able to tailor interventions on the basis of the readout, but that's in the future. Anyhow, um, this idea about temperament and a set point for happiness. Interesting research here is they followed people who say won the lottery. Woo, everything's really awesome, awesome, awesome. And then after a while, they kind of come back to where they were before. They've looked at people who have had spinal cord injuries. Oh my God, life transforming and not in a good way, profound loss. Difficulty, 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 but, a, but if you, you know, this is group data. So every one person's path through it is gonna be their own path. But after a while, kind of come back up to essentially where their level of happiness was, assuming that you know, they hadn't done other things. Um, some people do have a lo lower set point. Some people do have a higher set point. It's, you know, there's no fairness to it. It's just kind of the role of the genetic dice and, and who you picked for parents and the circumstances that you were born into. And biologically, we are wired, our whole emotional system is wired to be highly attuned to negative events and not so highly attuned to positive ones. Velcro for negative events. The notion here, if we look at it from an evolutionary psychology perspective, is that it was way more adaptive and kept us alive if we were spooky and hostile and suspicious and like, oh, no, 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 last time I did that, something bad happened, I'm not doing it again. Anybody who's seen the animated movie, The Croods, will remember that scene of where the dad is telling the bedtime story about once upon a time, there were these children, and they went outside the cave, and they got eaten! And so you don't go outside the cave anymore. You know, that, that, that kind of memory and really being able to hold that information was adaptive. Positive experiences are nice, but they don't save your life in a paleolithic environment quite to the same extent, so we don't have as much wiring for that. But we can cultivate a little bit more. And then this other interesting notion, what's called hedonic adaptation. Hedon hedonic means pleasure, like hedonism. And adaptation is getting used to. That we get used to all things positive. No longer noticing or feeling the same goodness or pleasure from them after a little while. You know, you get the new car, it's awesome, it's really, really great. And you're thinking, why don't I get the leather seats? You know, oh man, da da da, all this stuff. Um, and we just sometimes forget to pay attention to these things, too. Um, let's see, let's see. There is, a, oh, up, 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 back, back, back. Here is a perspective on this, which is actually quite wonderful. Let's see, oh, nope. Can I make this run? I cannot make this run. Okay, sorry guys. This was an old clip from Louis C.K. I will tell you what he says, because I love Louis C.K. He's do I don't know if anyone's ever heard his rant about everything is wonderful and we're all unhappy. <laughs> but he's talking about that part where somebody says they go on a flight and they come back and they are, oh, it was a terrible flight. Oh, we had to wait 20 minutes in the terminal to board and I was so tired. And, and then we, and we got out on, the, on the, the tarmac and they boarded us and then we had to wait 40 minutes to board, you know, to fly, oh, oh you know. And everyone's like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry for you. So sorry, it was terrible. And then he's like, what? Are you kidding me? Did you, did you not then fly? 
fly through the air like a bird in a chair in the sky like a Greek god and got to your destination safely and landed in this amazing thing that seems like you'd have to know the laws of physics to know why it works and it was and no one has ever been able to do this in the history of humanity until the Wright brothers came along and and you're bummed about the 40 minutes see I'm channeling my little Louis CK here but you know what I'm saying with all this we forget how awesome many everyday things are because we because we're used to them and what's different and what happens with us is that it's like oh yeah this inconvenience this thing that came up right now is front and center in our own heads so you should hear them go off about people who get cranky about wi-fi and airplanes you know it's like really you didn't have this at 20 minutes ago and now you're unhappy that it broke down please so um, anyway, but the point is, is what part of your experience are you paying attention to? And that kind of goes back to what we talked about a little while ago with the gratitude thing, the appreciation. Okay. So, let's talk about the science of happiness stuff. Positive psychology is a field within psychology, is a research field within psychology things, studies of well-being, studies of happiness, studies of what help people thrive, studies of character traits, all of this larger field you can see. Um, and I will tell you, 2001, nah, maybe about 400 publications. Well, this goes up to 2011, and you can see that, and these are peer-reviewed journal publications. Lots more work is happening, but it literally doubled, more than doubled in 10 years. So this is a very big and growing and vital area within the practice, um, within research psychology and also within clinical applications and clinical practice of psychology. It's very fun stuff. Um, but there's, you know, there's meat to it. It isn't just la la, rainbows, unicorns, et cetera. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about the things you can do, and I'm going to pull directly from the work of a psychologist at the University of Riverside, Sub Sonia Luberminsky. And she and her colleagues, she was, came up as a young graduate student right kind of at the beginning of this, this upsurge in uh, research work about what is, what is happiness and what fosters happiness and how do we understand the impact of happiness on people's lives, you know, all that kind of stuff. Getting out from just looking at the downsides of things, what makes things go wrong, to what makes things go right. And it kind of makes sense because if you want to have more things go well, it's good to understand them and the mechanisms that underlie that. It's kind of makes it sort of like, oh yeah, hey, that's a good idea. So she has published extensively. She's lect she lectures all over the world. She's written current. That's is not super recent. This is like well, 2008. I guess that's that's pretty recent. She's written some stuff since then, but her stuff is super practical. You know. She's even more of an empirically trained person than I am. She cannot say stuff unless there's substance to it. So this is her stuff. Um, myths about happiness. Well, happiness must be found. I'm waiting for my prince to come. You know, that, like, when am I going to be happy in life? When will I get lucky? When, 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 when? It has to come find me. Or I have to chase it. I have to pursue happiness. Pursue it, pursue it, pursue it. <laughs> you know, patting up the hillside after it. Or that you can't, if you're not happy, you gotta change your whole situation to be happy. If you're in a bad situation, sorry, you're out of luck. You, there has to be, happiness is found by changing circumstances. And then that sort of temperament personality thought about it, you either have it or you don't. Now, these are, as you see, myths. They are not, in fact, true. There are elements that could be true, but they're not, they are not universals. What determines happiness, as we understand now, the current model, is that it's about 50% genetic. You know, this, this temperament set point thing that I was talking about. Only 10% of, the, of what seems to predict happiness is life circumstances. Now that can be, you know, for an individual a big deal, but again, back to that thing about spinal cord injuries and winning the lottery, it definitely influences it, but not as much as we might think, and not necessarily for as long as people think that it would when something bad happens or something good happens. 
This is also, this life circumstance piece is interesting to th keep in mind when you we're thinking about what are my goals or what do I need to do in life or how do I need to aim myself. Um, certainly for people in college, the question of my major, my career track, how successful am I going to be, how much money I'm going to make. I've heard people panic because they didn't like the thing to do the things or were not skilled at doing the things that they thought would be high paid jobs. And, and okay, that is an issue, but to the point of where they kind of wrote themselves off about I am now well and truly doomed and felt quite demoralized by it. And because of, I mean, you know, if I can't have these particular set of circumstances, then I'm sunk in that way. But so look at this other piece, this 40% of overall happiness is influenced by intentional activities. And that's the 40% we're going to talk about for the next little bit. And none of the stuff is going to surprise you a bunch. Maybe some, you might not have known all of it, but this is pretty s commonsensical stuff. So how do you work that 40%? Um, intentional activity is stuff that you can do on purpose, whether it's mental or physical. Actions that you take or things that you deliberately think. Um, the advantage of being able to do things intentionally rather than just kind of waiting for them to come up spontaneously is that you can actually do it. You know whether or not you did it. You can vary it. You can, you can surprise yourself with what happens. You can make it fit your schedule. And you can do it on purpose and hold it in your mind and go, wow, look at that. I made this happen for myself. Wow, look at that. I, this has happened as a result of my actions. Huh. I think I can. I think I can. You know, there's that appreciation for self and effort and efficacy in there too. So this is not to say that people, this is like, oh great, you do all this stuff, you're never going to be unhappy. You'll be plenty unhappy. Life will take care of that. <laughs> I, you know, that's just kind of how it is. But this is this, it, life gets bigger. Life gets bigger in, and you get bigger on the inside. And that's a nice clinical term, bigger. So, okay, so here, I'm going to, here's the big list and then we'll touch on each of them quickly. Nothing too shocking here, is there? Expressing gratitude, cultivating op optimism, interrupting overthinking and avoiding social comparison. I will speak to this. This, is a, this for me is a significant one because of what I hear from the people with whom I work. Practicing acts of kindness, nurturing social relationships. Notice these are all action, action verbs. Expressing, cultivating, interrupting, practicing, nurturing, developing, learning, increasing, savoring, committing, practicing, avoiding, and taking care. They are things we do, not things that are done to us. Learning to forgive, developing strategies for coping, increasing flow experiences, savoring. We're going to talk about savoring too. Um, committing to your goals, practicing religion, spirituality, and taking care of your body, taking care of your mind, on a variety of means. Okay, so away we go. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts so far? Okay, let's go. All right, so activity number one in category number one, pay attention to the good. Activity number one, expressing gratitude. This is one that you probably have heard about because it is a common, common, common suggestion that people make is wh literally what am I grateful for? This is the, oh my God, I am sitting in a chair in the sky kind of intervention where you would purposely say, okay, what is going good for me right now? even though all this other crap is happening, what are the things that I appreciate? The mind sometimes resists this, but do it once a week, do it once a day, whatever suits you. It's something that, it's a, and it's an attention trainer. What we look for, we see. If we don't look for it, we may not see it and thus make the mistake of thinking that good things aren't there or we kind of miss them, we miss out on the pleasure of it. The, you know, the, the like, oh yeah, hey, that's right, a car, I am driving a car. Oh my gosh, I actually have good health. I, you know, it sort of sounds hokey pokey, but you know what I mean. Um, recognize, talk about, write about, talk to yourself, talk to other people, write in your journal. If you, and here's actually a very powerful intervention, is that thinking about, deliberately thinking about something that someone has done for you that has been beneficial to you and then communicating that to them. Whether it was somebody who, um, you know, like your classmate who showed you something about, oh, this is how this formula works. Oh, cool, now I get it. Hey, thank you, that was so great. Really simple. Or something very big, like getting back to somebody who had, who, whether or not they knew it, had done something that very help, really helped you, and you hunt them down on Facebook or you send them an email or whatever to express gratitude. 
it does not matter whether or not you reach that person, simply the expression of gratitude kicks on some fairly powerful feelings. I would tell you about the ways in which I do it, except I'd start choking up, and it would take too long. Um, and it's attending also to the ordinary stuff, the ordinary sweetness. You know, like, oh, it's a really nice day. How cool is this? You know, just, it, but that's a conscious action of attention. Our heads don't always want to do it, but it, when, they, when we do it, it pays off. Cultivating optimism, activity number two. One possible exercise is to write about your best pos possible future self. You know, set aside your doubts temporarily. You're just, you're just doing a writing exercise after all. You know, you're not committing to anything. And write about your best possible s future self, how you would like to be, and see what comes out. Reminding yourself about the information inherent in failure experiences so that you can learn. And the fact that nobody gets off, so why should you? With having to go through quite a bit of failure en route to learning how, what works for you. You know, this is a humanity thing. Okay, I'm going to get a little more time on this one. Avoiding overthinking and so social comparison. Overthinking, aka rumination, is that mental loop that we go around and around in, also called worry, where we think, oh my god, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, what if, what if, what if? And it feels like it's necessary, and it feels like we can't stop it, and it feels like in this weird way, that we're actually doing something to worry about it, because it feels like if we didn't worry about it, something worse might happen. Interesting thing, when we engage in worry, it, it, it sort of has this fall, it, it has kind of, a, it, it deceives us, it tricks us, that mental activity, because it activates some of the same reward circuits in the cortex that are activated by uh, approach action and, and doing something. So like, it's like thinking about it feels like doing something, so it feels really important, I have to think about this except that you know it's rumination when you keep thinking about it and nothing happens any different. You don't come up with any new insights, you don't come up with an action plan, you don't come up with any resolution, you don't, you know, you don't, doesn't put your mind at ease. And usually you can't even remember when you quit because it's usually because you got tired, distracted, fell asleep, or the phone rang. Like it doesn't get you anywhere. Sitting in the rocking chair going back and forth, that's rumination. So fraudulent feelings of agency is that sense that I'm actually doing something by thinking about it. The thing to do with it is you interrupt it, you distract it, you delay it. Okay, I'm going to think about this. I, I'm scheduling a worry 20 minutes date with myself at 7.30 tonight. Every time the I'm ki not kidding you. This is a, I, I appreciate that it sounds kind of weird, but it is a classic cognitive behavioral uh, way to address intrusive worry. You know, hamster reels running in your head. Those little suckers never get off the freaking wheel is to say, okay, fine. I'm going to worry about this, and you set the date, you keep the date, you sit there with a piece of paper in front of you so you can put it on the paper and get it out of the wheel, and you better be thinking about that because you made a date with yourself because there might be something useful that you need to think about, and then at the end of that time you put it away. During the day, when the worry comes up, you go, wait, wait, okay, fine, I'm scheduled that time, interrupt repeatedly, repeatedly, and then because you want to actually devote your full attention to it. Most of us worry while we're doing something else. We've not given it our full attention. Yes? OK, now let me just hand you mine. We will share. OK, sure. I find, uh, personally, I worry most like when I'm right about to go to bed. And there are things like, right now, I can't be doing, you know, May 1st is deadline for uh, the colleges. Yeah. So you have to put in your um, acceptance or your denial for whatever college you're going to choose. And even though I've already put in my acceptance, I find at night I really worry like, oh, well, what if I don't make the grades? Or, oh, Did what I if... Did I do the wrong thing? Exactly. You don't like going to the right college and all this stuff. And it's, there's no point in worrying about it because I'm about to fall asleep. But it's that, and then I never remember, oh, I should probably, I don't know, put in my deposit until, you know, the next, you know, couple days after that which I already have put in my deposit, but, <laughs> but the worry's there. It's a, thank you. it's a great example because it's like, it's uncertainty. The uncertainty prompts the worry. And you kind of know that things are probably going to work out okay, but there's no way to know for real. And the other lovely thing about what you just said is that while you're worrying, you never think of any of the practical things you actually need to do to make things go along, like put in the deposit. You have to remember that later. Isn't that wild? So interrupt. 
Okay, social comparison. Oh my God. Oh my word. This is this is intense. Lumberminsky and her uh, her colleagues found they asked happy people and unhappy people about do you compare yourself to others? Well, unhappy people do it all the time. Am I better? Am I worse? They get upset if people they think less of themselves when other people do better than they do. They feel weird when other people do, don't do as well. Well, if I'm doing better, then why am I not happy? What's the matter with me? I mean, they get it coming and going. Um, but happy people are like, well, why should I compare? That's so awesome that things are going well for these other people. Oh, bomb! They're having a hard time. They're empathic, you know, they, they are sympathetic in a good way. For, for people with a lot of unhappiness, it drives them crazy, absolutely crazy. And we've got to remember that people's, what people look like on the outside does not match necessarily what's going on inside. Well, everybody else looks like they're doing fine, so what? Are you sure? Did you ask them? No, they just look like it. So are you taking this as fact that you know what's going on in their heads and then and they're better than you are and you know this for sure because, you know, and their therapist starts to grind her teeth. I mean, I'm sorry, actually I don't. But we go over it again and again. And, and the whole social media thing, I'm not gonna talk about it. I could use the rest of our, our time today, but I have just gotta remind you that it, do not take this at face value. This cartoon came literally from the experience of the cartoonist, my favorite guy, Dan Pizarro, who draws Bizarro. He, he was sitting in a coffee shop. Here's all these people sitting there. You know, they're all, they're people like, they're not even talking to each other. They're on their phones. And then some guy goes, selfie, and they all go, ah, like, we're having the best time in the world, woohoo! And they post it, and then they all go back to completely disengaged. <laughs> well, gee whiz, what are you gonna think when you look at that? And I have to tell you that I am familiar with the research about people who look at stuff on Facebook and see their friends having a good time, feel worse about themselves, but guess what? If I go on Facebook, I feel worse. I have to really watch it. I have to talk to myself about this. And it just is, it just is. But the fact that we know it, you know, like, okay, let me counterbalance this a little bit and do that. Okay, next thing. Now we get to some of the stuff that you guys were talking about. Practicing acts of kindness, give it away. Your money, your love, your thoughtfulness, your kind comment, your time, your energy, it changes your view of yourself. It changes the way you see yourself. You change, you're not so inwardly focused. You're like, okay, what can I do? My little, my little steps in this big world, what can I do that in a small way makes things better? It connects you with other people. You feel like you're not isolated. And that for us human beings is a very big deal. Nurturing social relationships, just like putting the energy in. Just, you know, saying, hey, hi, how are you? I give people this behavioral assignment sometimes, is to smile and say hello. People who have difficulty with this, literally, okay, every day, three people, smile, say hello. Say hey, and you know, how's it going? Seriously, or if you know someone has had difficulty, to say, how are you holding up? Which is a better thing to ask, I believe, than asking them how they are, because if you say, how are you, someone's gonna say, fine or stressed, but they won't say anything, you know, it's, it's a social thing. But if you say, how are you holding up? They know that you actually are interested in what's going on for them, and then you can actually have a, a moment or two of genuine conversation if that's what they want to do. So just a little piece of advice there. Communicate, be supportive. Be ha when people, awesome things happen to people, woohoo! share their good fortune. They will feel better, you will feel better. Helps offset that inclination to compare oneself less favorably actively go woohoo in whatever way is appropriate to the situation. You have a mic. Uh, I think it's, this is probably a little more relevant to one of the slides that you just had up there, but um, I've heard uh, a, a really nice saying that, you know, in society, even if you're feeling like crap, you have a social obligation to at least act happy. And it's just like to kind of keep the, you know, the gears of society kind of rolling and, you know, just like, you know, it, does, it doesn't mean you have to necessarily lie. I mean, if you're talking to a good friend and say, hey, how are you doing? And you go, oh, I'm, uh, I'm having a really so great. bad day. Yeah. That's different. But, you know, if you're Like, having, don't dump. Huh? Don't dump on everybody. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. It's like, oh, it's a nice day, sucks. isn't it? Yeah, it's a nice day, isn't it? Oh, what's nice about it? Yeah. Well, nothing right, right, for you, right. obviously. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> nice day. Oh, what's nice about it? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. no being the pigeon of unhappiness pooping on somebody else because it, it will, and if for no other reason is it does not make you feel better. Yeah. Even if we don't, we do not even, we hold aside what happens to the other person, it does not make you feel any better to be the pigeon of doubt. Yeah. <laughs> And what that does is it also illustrates how 
you know, you're only focusing on your own pain, and your own pain is the only lens that you can see the entire world through. Inside and that little that freaking just gets glass bigger box. And bigger the more you, the more you look at that. Amen. Okay, forward we go. Last thing I want to say about this is hug. Literally, as threatening as that can feel, empirical findings are that students at a particular university who were assigned to do the five hug a day thing for about 10 days loved it. You know, they did it appropriately. And, you know, they had a reason to do it. Oh, I've got this assignment, can I, you know. And, but even though they were doing it on purpose because they were getting extra credit or doing their research project or whatever it was that they were doing, they felt better. And this is human. Oxytocin, which is a hormone, which is the same hormone that you experience after childbirth and after orgasm, gets cued when you hug. Easy, cheap, free. Be careful who you hug with a lot because you might find yourself feeling closer and trusting them more than what they've earned, but that's a whole other issue. We, will, we can go into that another time. But anyway, just regular, friendly, nice hug. Now, activity number six, developing strategies for coping. Figure that you will need them as in life, and so problem solving, giving yourself permission to struggle, knowing that, that it's yes, in fact, what we think that's going to happen is not ever what actually ends up happening, and that yes, it is okay to be called upon to do things that we did not expect to do. Ask for assistance, remind yourself about what's going well, this too shall pass, a thousand and one things. But, know that this is a virtuous thing to do. How am I going to get through this? Not why is it happening to me I've past about five minutes worth of that, and then how. Go to how. Learning to forgive. Here's this guy looking at himself in the mirror, having to think, OK, I'm holding this anger. It's only hurting me. It does not make things right. You know, where have I been forgiven? Trying to remember that, hold that. What can I appreciate about the other person's humanity and fallibility? It's not letting them off the hook and saying, oh, no, that's OK. It's all right that you X, Y, Z that was harmful to me. That's not it at all. It's not fighting with the fact of it and trying to step above it some. And it, whether or not they, whatever they think about it really does not matter because when people do this, they are doing it for themselves. The benefit comes to the person themselves. You, it's like freeing yourself up. And it's, it, it, is, it is hard work, it takes a lot of sweat, and done repeatedly. Okay, flow, activity number eight. This is a very interesting idea. I'm only going to touch it lightly. But it's this thing about when we do stuff that's challenging and we have to work at it, we get into that, pos uh, that experience where we're absorbed by something. Like, oh, I'm just doing this, and wow, time flew by, and I was just sort of in the moment. I was present in that moment. The thing about flow is that it requires challenge. And in that process of getting to it, we have to like sweat it. And like, oh my god, you know, if you, whether it's a skill or athletic thing, or there's the drudgery or the, the like, oh god, I'll never get any good at this. But to persist, remember we talked about persistence earlier? And then after a while, we get in these moments where it's like, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm not self-conscious about it. I'm just absorbed in what I'm doing. And it's an awesome, awesome feeling. So we just try to live our lives in that way. Savoring. The picture is of, of a kid taking a, a bite out of a peach. And have you ever done that where you get a peach that is so ripe that you kind of you have to sort of lean over to eat it? Because otherwise, if you didn't, you were going to be wearing it for the rest of the day. And at that moment, it was like the, the peach demanded your attention. And those are the best peaches, the best, most delicious, like, poof, happens in your mouth. And, you can feel it and taste it, and, and I can even, I, you know, like I'm th I might, the part of my head is going, yeah, remember the time? <laughs> With all of that, it's a savoring experience. Contrast that to the, the meals and the lovely things that you've eaten where you got done with it and thought, oh, shoot, I, it's done, it's gone now. I didn't even get the half of the pleasure out of it. Oh, shoot. Oh, there's no because we are a mind was someplace else so savoring the and we do mindfulness training here on campus i don't know if anybody's ever seen those pictures with the blue guy on them a big part of that practice is attending to the present moment experience because then we get to have juicy peach all the time 
or not all the time, but like when it's there, mm, man, juicy peach, yes. I was gonna say that one of the ways that I find savoring happens every day is by cooking. I cook and if you've ever cooked like a full meal for a full family of like five or six people, you know, yeah, it takes, it takes a long, it can take a long time and you have to be paying attention and you have to be there in that moment or else, you know, something's going to burn or something's going to boil over, but. Or you'll forget to make a part or you'll, of it and yeah. then you've got everything and you said, oh, wait, there's no. I else. forgot to put that in the oven, yeah. Um, but I think cooking for me is the easiest way to savor and also, while you're going through, you have to taste everything and you have to be making sure, you know, everything works together. And I think that's a it's useful awesome. way. It is a useful way and it, 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 you know, it's a sensory thing. The nice thing about cooking for other people is that then it's your, you're like, oh, this whole sensory experience and you're making it and you're putting effort into it and it's a gift for other people and, you know, there's just level and level and level and level of stuff that's going on there. So um, last year when we were doing mindfulness training in one of the, the uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience classes, one of the students came back who'd been training for a while and she said, you know, I got out of class the other day and I was walking across campus and I was thinking about, oh man, I got the stuff to do, no, 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 and, you know, heads full of stuff, 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 stuff of what I have to do next. Oh, what am I going to do? And then she went, oh, wait. Oh, what's happening right now? And she said, and I sort of stopped, and the wind came up the hill, and I just kind of like, oh, the sun and the air. Oh, this is really nice. And you know, boop, 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 went off on her way, just that moment of savoring. And it was perfect. So I said, oh, great, cool. So what happened to the things you needed to do? And she goes, oh, no, actually, there was nothing that day that I needed to do. I was just thinking about stuff that was coming up. Well, was there something you needed to like take care of today for that? No, no, I was just you know running through it in, all in my head. There was nothing she needed to do, but it was taking her out of the juiciness of that moment, and she got back into it. So that the juicy peach all over the place. Um, committing to your goals. I think we have talked about this in in a lot of different ways. This purposeful activity, building happiness is effortful, does involve frustration and persistence of effort. The good part is that those things are intensely meaningful to us. And you know, we feel that and appreciate that strong, more strongly and have great ownership other than, uh, more so than things that get handed to us. I mean, it's awesome to have good fortune, no, no doubt about it. Um, you know, opportunity for gratitude, wow, this is amazing. But when we earn stuff, there's a whole nother level of things going on. So you find a few things that are meaningful to you that you can take yourself in small steps towards. And remind yourself that you're aiming towards them too. Activity number 11, seeking out meaning and purpose, looking for the sacred and the ordinary. Spending time with people who have similar perspective, um, taking a little bit of time every day to, to go deep. Whether it's a formal prayer, formal meditation practice, or just that consideration of the world that is bigger than you. Um, looking for inspiration in your life. And taking care of your body, taking care of your soul. Mindfulness training again. This is the sort of the basic pieces of that. And I will touch them lightly because we could go on and on about this. But it's a deliberate practice where you deliberately sit and watch your experience and without having to do anything else about it, except bring your fo focus back when it wanders off and simply notice what's happening. It promotes attention, concentration, performance, calming ability, you get stronger, more flexible, and have greater endurance mentally and emotionally. I could go on and on. And uh, Monday's at one, Tuesday's at, at four, Fountain Hall, 112A behind the Career Transfer Center. Or, or online too. We actually offer it, uh, the online version of our course, and you can link to it through the Student Health Center's website. So, mindfulness. Um, exercise. Exercise in many research studies has beaten SSRI and antidepressants for treatment of depression. It, we are animals, we need to regulate and live in our bodies, and we don't, we live this weird lifestyle where we sit and we don't have sunlight on us and we sit on our butts and we don't interact with other people face to face. And we are not well wired for this, so it really helps us do that. Sometimes I prescribe people to go to the stairwell, the one that, that goes between Academic Center parking lot and um, the Campus Center, and to go up and down those stairs three or four times, like before a test when they're freaking out. Okay, stairs, stairs, go do the stairs, and then see how you feel. It is very difficult to ruminate when you're, <gasps> you know, and your heart's thumping and you're doing all that stuff and you're laughing because you know, oh my God, 
and it just it's a very powerful in rumination interruption kind of strategy. Okay, laughter. Laughter is kryptonite to worry and discontent. We cannot hold those two states of mind together at the same time. And when you smile, it's an interesting thing. Smiling is not only the expression of positive emotion, but when we hold our faces in that position, it feeds back up right through the brain strain, right into the limbic system saying, okay, we're smiling, everything's good. This little nudge, I kid you not. They've done, oh, I could go on and on and tell you all the stories about the research they've done where they make people hawking in their teeth that makes it look like they're smiling. There's no humor involved with it at all, but people then laugh, find funny things more amusing, and that's the only thing they did differently. It's ridiculous. Yes. Oh, Mark. I was going to say, I just watched this video. Just watched this video yesterday. It was a TED Talk, and they were talking about how uh, these power poses, I don't know if you've heard of it, like, I think her name's Kate Cuddy. Oh, uh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, there's like Wonder Woman pose, and then like there's this kind of like. Would you, back you, you, do, you, do you know this? Would one of you stand up and, and just like, like make Well, it she could do Wonder Woman better than I could. Yeah. Oh, hands on your hips. Oh, the Superman did this too. Yeah, he, he does that too. So right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but doing that for ten minutes, I mean two minutes, actually increases the serotonin. Not serotonin, uh, testosterone, testosterone, and lowers your cortisol levels within two Stress minutes. Hormone, yes. And um, yeah, just kind of making this a practice, just throwing it out there. Such amazing stuff. Yeah. It's kind of like you can fake yourself out. You can use your higher mind, your rational mind that can understand these things to kind of through the back door into the emotional mind, which is a total sucker for experience, and, and give it a nudge in the desired direction. Okay, so we're kind of getting up to the end of our time. And just just saying, we're going to have to stop here in a minute because people will be saying, physics class, physics class, or whatever. But right. Oh, just for the Wonder Woman post, I had a ma uh, math teacher in high school that had, a do had us do that three minutes um, before every test. And? Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't do all math, but I, I, I felt like I did. <laughs> <laughs> so so your, your test performance reflected more of your ma kind of where you were at at that point and less of your anxiety. Um, I would agree. I wasn't anxious during the test. Yeah. It was just like, I got this, I got this. I mean, I probably, yeah, I didn't get it, but I felt like I did. <laughs> Which means that if you, to the extent that you, the stuff you did get, you were able to show, yeah. I would assume. Okay. So, let's see. Am I, did I, yep, yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Number 12. So, you don't have to remember all to do this stuff all by yourself. There is a ton of information and structured, structured methods that are out there that are cheap, that are free. Um, the, the book title up there is The How of Happiness, which is Dr. Lubomirsky's book. Um, very practical, easy to read, you know, not just very accessible. There are apps, and I wouldn't even begin to, you know, to evaluate them, but this Happyfy is, a, is very well regarded. Um, it, it is stuff that you do, stuff that you do. Life reimagined, um, even though you may notice that it is sponsored by the American Association for Retired Persons. And so people under the age of 50, or even those of us who are over, are like, ah, no, I'm not sure about that. Ignore that. Ignore that. I played with this stuff. It is awesome. It is awesome. They are structured exercises. You don't, I mean, it, these are optional, obviously. You know, there's no extra points for them. But if you don't want to have to figure all this stuff out for yourself and you want to use something that's got some basis to it and, you know, do evidence based stuff, very easy, handy way of engaging with that. So, you know, or us therapists or your own process. But the, what we are talking about to go back to that idea is the 40% of happiness that you can influence through deliberate action that contributes both to positive affect side of things and meaningful life side of things. The stuff, the enduring one, and the one that lets you savor what is good every single minute. Don't have to wait to, for it to go to Disneyland. I mean, Disneyland's awesome. But you see plenty of people fighting there or not looking so happy. You know, the ju but to not miss out on all the juicy peaches that are available to you every day. So I think that that's that. That's good. So awesome. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit. But let, it, let me poke a nose out. I do not see tons of people standing in the corridor, so evidently we do not have to flee right away. But thank you very much for coming. Um, 
I will be talking about this stuff again next week. It's like, you know, I'll be in town all week, folks. Thank you, thank you. But um, on Multicultural Day. So I will be essentially doing similar presentation, the same presentation, talking a little bit more about stuff that we do with other people, since our theme this year is to create cultures of care. So thank you, thank you, thank you.